We all know that natural selection causes adaptive evolution. However, there are ways that populations can evolve that are not based on natural selection, and in fact, they can be quite random like this tornado in the background. The first one is called genetic drift. So they, basically, genetic drift is a change in allele frequency due to chance. And this could be through bottlenecks, it could be through founder effects, or any way that you go from a large population to a small population. And the idea of the founder effect is that a few individuals from a larger population, they start a new population with a different allele frequency than the original population. Well, there's a couple key points we wanna know about genetic drift. And the first one is, it's random. It's random with respect to fitness. This is unlike natural selection, which actually leads to an increase in fitness in a population. Genetic drift is totally random, and it's most pronounced in small populations. And this is a big deal in conservation biology, where we're often dealing with small populations that face the effects of genetic drift. And the reason why is because genetic drift can lead to random loss or fixation of alleles. Now this can be good or bad. If you're losing randomly a deleterious allele, well that's good. On the flip side, if it becomes fixed in a population, meaning that's the only allele you have, then it's bad. So with a bottleneck, what happens to the bottleneck is you've got a large population. And for whatever reason, that large population gets really small very quickly. And that is what we call a bottleneck. So you can see here the bottlenecking event and the surviving population is a small representation of the once larger population. And as a result of randomly sampling part of the larger population, you have a loss of alleles and that can lead to genetic drift. So we often see uh, genetic drift with founder effects you have a new oceanic island pops up into existence and the first animals that land there or plants that land there represent a small subset of the total population where they originated. And as a result, when you get to the island, you have much um, less genetic diversity. So here's a founder effect. You've got them migrating out from a larger population. And like I said, the, the founders are gonna have a subset of the total diversity that you would find uh, from your main population. And this is just showing some beetles here. You can imagine you got these beetles that are both yellow and red. And somehow your island only gets the red ones. That represents a subset of the original with a total uh, diversity you found on the mainland. So this founder effect, these islands start off with less genetic diversity. So genetic drift is, like I said, that's a change in allele frequency. And this is due to chance, unlike natural selection, which is selecting for these alleles, this is completely random. Gene flow represents another way that you can change allele frequencies in a population. You can imagine you've got two different populations and uh, we've got both of these populations are homozygous and uh, one is dominant HH for whatever that blue color is. And the other one is recessive H, H, little h, little h for the red color. What happens is when uh, a bird migrates from one population to another, they're gonna bring in a new set of alleles into that population. And because you're bringing in new alleles, guess what? You're changing the allele frequency of that population. So gene flow is uh, important for adding in genetic diversity to a population. Now gene flow gets kind of complicated, but migration is very important for like I said, bringing in new com new alleles, which would create new combination of alleles in a population. So gene flow, it definitely can alter the allele frequency of a population by bringing in a new set of alleles. However, gene flow is really complicated, especially when we start thinking about metapopulations. Metapopulations are populations of populations. So you can imagine that you've got these populations and they're, they're being kept from diverging from each other through gene flow, okay? So that means rather than having these populations completely separate and they start accumulating changes over time, you know, gene flow, migration between the populations 
would maintain them as a single species over time, but allow for local adaptations. Another thing about metapopulations is you might set up source sink dynamics. Some habitats and, or some populations might be in great habitat and they produce a lot of offspring. And those offspring, they leave those and go to other smaller habitats that might be a little less optimal. And those would of course form the sinks. When it comes to evolution, mutations are vitally important. You see, genetic variation is actually reduced by both natural selection and genetic drift, but it's mutations that ultimately create new variation in a population. Although gene flow increases uh, genetic variation, it's not creating new alleles or new genes. Only mutations can do that, and that's incredibly important to remember. For example, it's mutations that created the white flower in Mendel's pea plants. So that was a point mutation. And basically that mutation made it impossible for this plant to produce anthocyanin. Anthocyanin is a pigment that makes these plants purple. So the mutation basically knocked out part of that metabolic pathway, creating white flowers. You know, and luckily for these pea plants, well, white flowers also attract pollinators, so they just weren't, that allele wasn't just immediately wiped out from the population. It's actually kept because it adds a more genetic variation. Another important type of mutation is called a gene duplication. And gene duplication often occurs during meiosis, specifically during prophase one, where you get unequal crossing over. In this case, you might get a chromosome that has two copies of the same gene. Eventually, this leads to the origin of gene families, which can be important for things like olfaction. For example, gene families are important in the evolution of mammals. I mean, if you go back, mammals are 200 million years old, but dinosaurs became dominant in the Mesozoic, and the mammals could not become with could not compete so well with the dinosaurs, especially during the day. So they had to become nocturnal. Now that means several different things. One is they relied on a sense of smell. So to smell, you have to have receptors in your brain to detect odors. So the more receptors you have, the more different types of odors you can detect. And the way to get all those different odor detectors is through gene duplication. Because every single time a gene duplicates, what that means is it can now mutate and detect a slightly different molecule in the environment. So if you've ever noticed your dog, they sniff everything, right? And because your dog is out there sniffing everything, they have over a thousand genes to detect odors in their environment. It's amazing. You and I, we have about half of those that are still active, so we're pretty good at detecting odors. The other half, well, they've been lost over evolutionary time and are now called pseudogenes. And if you look at whales and dolphins, they can't detect any odors in their environment, but they still have those same thousand or so pseudogenes that have been knocked out over time. When they lost their sense of smell, it didn't really affect their evolution. You know, through the first part of the century, a bunch of really bright guys came up with a modern synthesis, you know, and that started thinking about evolution in terms of populations and combining what we knew about uh, Gregor Mendel's genetics with evolution. That's where we get the change in allele frequencies over time. And we know that new alleles and new genes are caused by mutations, but Part of our extension of that modern synthesis has to account for something called lateral gene transfer. This is amazing. You know, evolution by Darwin's idea is basically vertical gene transfer. You acquire your genes from your parents. Lateral gene transfer, I don't know if this is also mutations or gene flow, I'm not sure how we could consider this, but basically you can get genes from your environment into the individual and pass those on to the next generation. So for example, there are these green and red morph aphids. And basically through lateral gene transfer, they've acquired things like beta carotene and toriolene. And uh, they're under dominant, this is actually under balancing selection. And those genes are coming from um, the fungus to the aphids that these um, aphids are exposed to. And it's pretty wild that they can do that. Another one 
is a lateral gene transfer between algae and uh, this sea slug called Alicia chlororotica. This is a sea slug, and what it does is it eats algae. And then instead of just totally digesting the algae, it can actually take the chloroplast in that algae and incorporate it into its tissues. Now, over evolutionary time, it's acquired some of the genes required to maintain those chloroplasts inside of its tissues. So what that really means is that you've got a photosynthetic animal. Now, photosynthesis is not going to produce enough energy for this animal to be totally active, but it can definitely help it during lean times. Here's one of my favorite examples. You know, you and I, we're, we're Ethereans, specifically we're Eutherians, commonly known as placental mammals. And uh, uh, what's interesting about it is we give live birth. And lots of things give live birth. Sharks and some snakes do, and other fish give live birth as well. However, what makes our live birth so unique is we have a placenta that connects the uterus of the mom or the mom to the growing baby through an umbilical cord. Okay, when they completed the entire human genome, they realized that one of the important proteins called synictin it is used to connect the placenta to the virus came from a retrovirus. Think about that. A protein used to connect the placenta to the uterus came from a retrovirus. What that means is a viral infection that inserted its DNA into the DNA of our mammalian ancestors millions of years ago helped with the evolution of mammals in terms of giving live birth and using a placenta. Now it turns out this story has become more complicated because we've learned over time that similar viral infections have occurred at least six times in different mammalian lineages affecting our evolution. So like I said, this is like a, an extension to the modern synthesis of evolution. It's like understanding how we'll fit in this lateral gene transfer. And I mean, to put this also into perspective, you're like, you know, between five and 8% viral genome. I mean, eight to 5% eight to of your DNA is a viral origin. Now, the question is, what is it doing in there? 